I want to actually ask us to start by turning to the person next to you for a moment. If you don't know the person next to you, I want you to introduce yourselves and say Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> I know, we finally quieted this room down. Okay, so now that you know your neighbor, did anyone meet someone you didn't know just now? Okay, a few, oh, great. Okay, good. So I actually want to ask you to turn to your neighbor, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask a question, which is, how would you answer the following question? Are you a religious person? Turn to this, per this absolute stranger sitting next to you and answer this question. Are you a religious person? Okay, come back to me. Now I want to ask you in your chavruta to answer this question. What does it mean to be a religious person? A little bit harder, and I'm going to give you about 30 seconds for that one. What does it mean to be a religious person? I'm going to take three answers out loud. What does it mean to be a religious person? What does it mean to be a religious person? Yes, Florine, as loudly as you can so we can hear you. That's beautiful. This idea, Florine's idea of being religious is that God gave every person a divine spark and that each one of us is called to walk a path toward making a more just future. Beautiful. Amen. Anyone else? What does it mean to be a religious person? Yes. I hope, I hope folks could hear Kate. She said, to identify your core values and then live those values on a daily basis. Anyone else? Anything different? Yeah. Okay. To love one another fully. Now I'm going to ask you publicly, like, just raise your hand if you, if you identify as a religious person. Now that you've heard. Wow. Okay. I, the reason I'm starting here, and thank you, thank you for those who shared with each other, and thank you for those who shared publicly. I remember a week or so after the 2016 election, when so much was up in the air about the future of our country, but one thing that we learned was that a strong and significant determinant of whether a person voted one way or the other was how many times a month that person went to church or to synagogue. And what they found was that the more a person was engaged with a faith community, the more likely they were to vote conservative. Now, among white Americans, we learned, worship service attendance remained highly correlated with presidential vote choice among white Americans. In other words, voters who frequently go to religious services at least once a month were more likely in that election in 2016 to vote for a candidate who mocked a disabled reporter, who was credibly accused by numerous women of sexual violence, who was known for his corruption and for his callousness and for his racism, for his narcissism, and for his noxiousness. And those who came to shul and to church less often were more likely to vote for the other person. That's all we knew. And by the way, don't think that this is only in America. In Israel, too, we've seen that Israel's most extremist politician, as we discussed last week, someone previously known only as a marginalized provocateur, attracted unprecedented support from young ultra-Orthodox Jews. In fact, the party that calls itself religious Zionism is now the third most powerful party in the country. We've seen this rightward shift happen among religious people, both here and there, and in many places around the country and around the world. And I have to tell you, I struggle with that. I struggle with it mightily because, to be honest, I fully expect that deeper engagement with holy texts and with timeless sacred ideas, that deeper attachment to communities of care and faith would lead to greater acceptance, to more compassion, to a more principled commitment to equity and equality, 
to restorative justice, to environmental protection, to the quest for peace. And yet this week, according to an NBC exit poll, we learned that 88% of the people who identified as white born again or evangelical Christian voted for a candidate who identified himself as a warrior for God. And yet I wonder what kind of God he thinks would applaud his behavior, like when he put a gun to his ex-wife's head, or when he lied and cheated and disowned and abused his children physically and emotionally. And I'm struggling with this, as you can see. I'm struggling with how it could be that 88% of those people who call themselves religious would choose to support a politician and a politics of cruelty and callousness over and against a person who has unquestionably dedicated his whole life to being a servant of God, who preaches the gospel every Sunday, who feeds the poor and the hungry, who cares for the orphan and widow, who calls democracy the political enactment of a spiritual idea. Isn't that beautiful? The political enactment of a spiritual idea who preaches every week this notion that each of us in our diverse and variegated humanity are in some ways sparks of the divine. He says again and again, and I've heard him myself, we were created in the image of God. He says, faith is not a weapon, it's a bridge. And I don't understand. I don't understand how when these two candidates are poised to, to battle one another, how people who consider themselves religious choose the candidate whose views and whose character are anathema to everything that we might learn if we were to take our sacred text seriously. I can't fathom what that religious life looks like. I don't understand. But I look to our Parsha to see what our religious life looks like. And I see in the beginning of Parshat Vayera, and God appeared to Abraham in the tents of Mamre. Where Abraham was sitting, the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. And Abraham was having this transcendent moment, this moment of spiritual ecstasy because God has appeared to him in the heat of the day in the entrance of his tent. He lifts up his eyes, vayar, and he sees something. And look, there are three homeless guys who are standing not far from where he is. God is visiting Abraham. He's just had surgery just a few days before, as you might recall. God is engaged in an act of bikor cholim, an act of visiting the sick. I'm checking on you, my love. How are you? This is the very essence of everything that Avraham has hoped for, but he's distracted. He looks up and he sees these three men and he tells, he tells God, wait a minute, there's some people who I need to go and care for. I just want to note for a moment, if you've been following along this morning as Jonah was reading, that the way that Abraham behaves in this moment is in stark contrast to what we're going to see right afterwards, the way that people were treated in Sodom where they were famously protective of their wealth to the point of committing incredible acts of violence against any foreigners or any visitors, but not our guy, not Abraham. He's in the midst of communion with God and he looks up and he sees three guys who look hungry and tired and dirty and they need his love. So he tells God to wait. And my friend, Rabbi Scheiheld, he says, is this the ethical postponement of the theological? Is that what's happening in this moment? Asking God to wait while we go and care for those in need. You know, this reminds me of a story that Bishop Barber tells about his grandmother, who was a religious woman. And he would go in and see her cooking up a storm in the kitchen. And she would say, I need to go hope some people. And he would say, hope some people. I think you mean help some people. And she'd say, no, no, no. I need to go hope some people. I need to give them hope by giving them help. That was her faith in action. And I remember a couple of years ago that Sam Hutman shared with me a story. Where are you, Sam? Sam shared with me a story that was told to her by our friend Samuel, who goes to a church of Caribbean immigrants downtown Los Angeles. 
I hope you remember this story. One day his pastor preached this Torah that's so powerful. He said, say you're walking down the street in Los Angeles or Chicago or New York, and a man runs naked in front of you on the sidewalk and he's screaming and he's cursing. So what do you do? Most of us, this pastor said, we briskly cross the street and we think that guy's unwell. I don't want him anywhere near me. But say you live in a tiny town, maybe a town of 50 households, and, and you're walking around one day when a naked man runs in front of you on the sidewalk and he's screaming and he's cursing. But because you live in a tiny town, you know this man, he's Henry. And you know that last week, Henry suffered a terrible tragedy. A fire burned Henry's house down and he lost everything. Then what do you do? Henry, you say, come home with me, my friend. You need some food. You need some place warm and safe to sleep. The question of our lives is, what does it take to shift our collective consciousness from stranger who is unwell to Henry, my neighbor, created in God's own image and in need of love and care just like I am? I love the story at the beginning of this week's parsha. I love that Abraham tells God to wait a minute so he can go take care of three hungry people because it's so clear that he's not actually asking God to wait at all. That instead, what Abraham's doing is centering God within those three men, centering God in three people who are in great need and meeting God there instead of there. Serving those men, who need care in that moment was not an abandonment of the divine. It was a cleaving to the divine. Now, I wanna say that there's a huge spectrum of belief in this faith community. And there's a huge spectrum of religious practice in this room. But I believe, or at least I hope, that all of us understand that to encounter God is to encounter those three hungry men. It is to encounter Henry. It is to encounter each other and to see one another as precious images of the divine, every single one of us. And that is a theological argument. That is a spiritual argument, but that is also a political argument. Because frankly, it means nothing to dream of a world in which every single person is an image of the divine and then work to stymie and stifle and control and contain and humiliate and incarcerate and impoverish and disenfranchise God's own image in this world. That is what we call a chilul Hashem, a desecration of God's name. The work of faith, the work of religion is both theological and it is political. It's to recognize the divine image in every one of us and then to work with everything we've got to realize that divine image through creating the conditions in which God's image can flourish. That's it. That's the whole project. I don't know what's happening in Georgia. I don't know. I know I can barely recognize the face of religion in America today, not to mention in Israel, not to mention everywhere else in the world. I know that in the last few decades, we've seen religion gone awry. We've seen a flourishing of so-called religious actors engaging in regressive attempts to curb the rights and freedoms of those people who just already happen to be the most vulnerable in our society, and they've done it in God's name. I know that we have watched religious actors fueling or committing acts of violence in God's name. I know that we've seen insurrectionists praying on the Senate floor, thank you, Heavenly Father, for being the inspiration needed, they said, to allow us to send a message to the tyrants and the communists and the globalists, which I think is us. <laughs> this is our nation, they said, not theirs. And they said it in God's name. This is the expression of a violent, extremist religious nationalists. This is the same brand of violent religious extremism that's been growing in dominance in our country for many years. Religious extremists as a driving force behind violent racist attacks, attacks on women and LGBTQ people. It's too common today to see violent, vile attacks online from people who have Christian husband and father in their social media bios. 
And this isn't new. This isn't new because religion for millennia has been manipulated in all religious communities to wield power and to justify violence and to serve nefarious actors. Religious identity and religious practice have long been decoupled from religious purpose. Piety has been decoupled from performance, so much so that today it's barely even notable to encounter people who consider themselves religious and behave in absolutely abhorrent ways. I know what religious should look like. I would love if every one of you found kashrut, observing Jewish dietary laws, as meaningful as I do. But it's not about what you eat. And I've been working for two decades to share my love of Shabbat with this community. And still, I promise you, from the very depths of my being, I don't care if you got here today on foot or if you drove two hours to get here. I talk to God every day, even when I doubt that God's listening. For me, God is real and some days very present. And still, I'm not troubled at all by beloved members of our community who are avowed atheists. A religious person is someone who sits in the entrance of her tent, in the heat of the day, even when she's suffering in pain herself, and she waits and she watches because she knows that there are people out there on that hot day who need love and care even more than she does. And she knows that if she looks closely, she can find God in each and every single one of them. I pray that our religious lives, our faith commitments open our hearts with compassion and tenderness, that it reminds us all that we belong to one another, that it gives us hope as we work together to achieve what can only be a collective liberation. And I pray that our religious connections and our religious commitments are our fuel a driving force that in our commitment to build a just and equitable society, a society of radical accountability, a home in which all people can live with dignity and love, remind us every single day of who we are and who we are called to be in this world and in this time. That is my prayer. I wish you Shabbat Shalom.